Yeah, okay, so let's begin with an introduction. Um, hello, this is a talk about uh, Docker, um, running OpenCast in Docker. And um, I'm Matthias Neugebauer. Uh, I'm Jan Koppe. And we are from the University of Münster. And since everyone is proud here showing the pictures about uh, um, their palace, <laughs> we have one too. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, the main building in our university. But actually, um, our campus is sort of whole Münster, because everywhere there are buildings um, from our university. And uh, we just started um, adopting OpenCast. Our goal is to um, deploy capture agents in 20 rooms. And um, currently, we think, um, um, yeah, um, currently we want to um, do this in the next summer term in, in three rooms. We use um, Gali Casa Pro at the moment, or we want to use it. And we have a custom built capture agent. But we want to uh, now to um, talk about uh, the server side, use OpenCast, the distributed setup, and um, VMs of um, our infrastructure in, in the university. And we are using Docker. So just uh, in this introduction, um, who here has used or who here has heard of Docker? Nice. Nice. So um, who here has used Docker? OK. So also quite a bunch of you. Um, but nevertheless, for those of you who don't know what Docker is, it's um, a tool that allows you to um, create a lightweight virtualization. Um, all of those features are actually part of the Linux kernel itself. So um, it doesn't matter what operating, what um, Linux version or whatever you use, you most likely can use Docker. And uh, it's yeah, it's pretty lightweight virtualization technology um, where you can isolate processes and the file system um, yeah, and so on. And Docker allows you to use those features of the kernel. Um, and the goal is that you can distribute the package, distribute and run your application anywhere on any Linux um, system. Docker itself is a client server. Um, has a client server um, architecture, and this allows you uh, to run the Docker client, for example, on Windows or on um, Mac OS X, and um, the actual server or the actual um, running of the application is done in, for example, a VM or in the cloud or wherever. Um, so coming to the first um, two parts, packaging and distributing of applications, Docker is something called uh, Docker Images. And Docker images are um, essentially um, a layered file system plus some metadata. So you have, uh, for example, here in this example, we have um, Ubuntu um, base image. And here are all files um, in a typical minimal Ubuntu, Ubuntu um, file system. So you have your apps get and um, whatever. And on top of that, so this part is read only, but when you want to add uh, new software, new libraries, new dependencies, you create a new file system, system on top of that, depending on the one below, and you add um, your, all your files, um, all your additions, and so on. Um, those images, those two here, are present only once on your system. And you can build an Nginx, for example, depending on um, this image here and the MySQL uh, also depending on this image here. And uh, those two file systems only need to be present once, so you can save some space there. And uh, this is a packaging. Coming to the distribution, there's something called Docker regist registries, um, with the uh, default uh, being Docker Hub. And uh, okay, so let's just. Uh, have a short demo, can you switch to the terminal? Makes it bigger. Nice. Come on, let's listen. Can you read that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have the Docker client tool and we can, um, for example, um, 
sh uh, search for images, so for example, um, Ubuntu, and this is calling out to uh, Docker Hub and uh, looking through every image here, uh, which has the name Ubuntu. Uh, we can um, get images from um, Docker Hub. For example, there is an image called Hello World. And it's again calling out, and here you can see um, some IDs. And this image actually contain uh, is is uh, to, um, yeah, comprised of two layers, and Docker is pulling each of them. This is a pretty short image, so you can um, it's it's pretty um, fast, uh, and then you have um, it on installed on your system. You can uh, see that by running Docker images, and here you can see all the images that there are um, that are installed on this uh, on this uh, machine. Um, can we switch to this slide? Um, so you you can now download your application and what, whatever, but you want to run them really. Um, so the next part is the Docker container, and since um, this, these are based on Docker images, and since every image here is read only. We had yet another um, file system on top of um, the file system of the um, um, image, which is um, read and write. And uh, then we can start the proce process within this file system fully um, isolated um, from, from the host. So we have a new network stack, a new um, process list, new uh, list of users, and so on. And a file system where we can write our stuff. Okay, um, let's uh, switch to the demo again. Can we hold that? Um, so let's just uh, uh, um, start running one container. So we downloaded the Hello World container, and we can run that. There is uh, some metadata that is telling, okay, which uh, process should be run within this um, image. And this is just a Hello World example, which, uh, which um, output some, some things here. And it's telling us, okay, so um, here's another example we can, can run. So just run um, an Ubuntu image. We can say it to be interactive and uh, create a pseudo uh, terminal. Um, say what what image we want to run and what process should be run in here. So um, with Docker, um, there should be um, in, in each container uh, you have to specify what process you have to s you, have, you want to start here. And when we um, okay, you don't have Ubuntu. <laughs> okay, let's like just Ubuntu. wait. <laughs> just wait a sec. It's uh, download. So when you, the image is not part. Um, uh, when you don't have the image yet, it's downloading um, all the layers, and this is taking some time. And then now we are in the container. Um, let's do that again, so that you can see. Um, so when we run, um, the, when we want to start a new container based on the Ubuntu image again, now it's uh, pretty quick. So. And in here, it feels like it's an actually v VM, but it's not. Um, so the first thing I want you to notice is that how quick it was to create this isolated environment. Um, this, so this virtualization technology is pretty cheap. And when we, <laughs> uh, so and we are fully isolated. Uh, we can, uh, we have a uh, own host name here. We, we can see that we have uh, mm, um, all our own network devices. We can run things like app get, um, so all the Ubuntu tools which you um, which you are used to. Um, let's break that. Um, what else? So you can see I'm root in this container. You can see that we have um, our own list of of users in here. And also, when you look at the processes, those are all also isolated from from um, our host system, um, which with uh, Bash being process ID one. So this is um, something which is um, 
different from typical from from normal VMs. So we don't have a unit system normally in in uh, in the Docker container. Um, you um, so there is this best practice to only have one process or one one type of process in in one Docker container and comprising them uh, and comprising a, um, a a larger system with multiple containers connecting them and and so on. Okay. <coughs> Now back to the slides. Um, so we have talked about wha how we can uh, start a container, but we don't know how to create an image. Um, so you, you have two options here. Um, the first one being that you um, can run uh, on, a, on, on some image, for example Ubuntu, install all your stuff, configure, and, and, and so on, and then, and then um, close this container, which uh, this container is still present on, on your system, and you can commit all, this, all the changes you have done to um, the read and write file system and, and creating a new image. But um, a better alternative is to create a Docker file, which does all the things um, automatically. So you can say what image you want to start from, how, um, add some metadata about the maintainer, um, install your software, configure it, uh, say what user you want to run the software, declare some ports um, which you can expose and also um, say what process you want to start um, by default when you don't um, uh, specify a process. Um, features of Docker. Um, Docker with Docker you can, we, you have already seen that, create, start, uh, stop containers, but you can also pause containers and later on start them. Um, you have uh, volumes, here you can mount um, folders for some configuration or, or um, whatever you can mount from your host to your um, container. Um, you have uh, net networking features like uh, port forwarding to the host system. Um, Docker has uh, in, in the newer versions a plugin system. Um, so if you want, you can actually um, yeah, use um, a Tor networking service and yeah. You said for uh, networking, um, you have control over your resources, so you can actually say, I want all processes running in this container only using so and so much um, memory. Uh, you can actually say, uh, okay, run this only on the third CPU. And the ecosystem of Docker is uh, pretty large as well, so there are quite uh, yeah, a few of um, external applications that can um, use um, uh, they can um, use docker um, so what um, what advantages does it have first of all it you have seen that it's pretty uh, cheap to to create in such an isolated environment if you want to create an VM, VM this takes um, way more time and then um, every Dependency, every configuration is part of the image, so you have a reproducible um, environment um, throughout the development, testing, production system. Um, it doesn't matter where, where you run your container. If you have just uh, a Linux system, um, just start a container and it will hopefully uh, be reproducible. Um, also, uh, when you package your s applications in a Docker image, um, it, those images are deployed and, and run um, exactly the same. You have the same process there. Um, it doesn't matter what system you have, so it could be complicated as hell, I don't know, but uh, you can just start it. Um, then you, with Docker you can focus more on the application side. What you can pretty, uh, what's, what's pretty easy to do with Docker is to um, have a bunch of uh, machines, bunch of nodes, connect them, and just say, okay, this is a cluster, just run three of those um, containers. I don't care where you do that, but just run them. Um, and uh, yeah, you can run multiple version versions side by side. So when you have software depending uh, on uh, some library in a in a really specific version and another software also depending on that library but another version you don't uh, um, have a collision there and also when you run um, 
open cast or wh whatever, you can run multiple versions side by side. Um, okay. Uh, so what we actually provide are uh, ready-built OpenCast images um, that we've built with our Docker files. Um, we license them under the ECL 2.0, and so you can use them. Uh, contributions are welcome. Um, you can find them uh, on the Docker Hub, which is the standard repository, and uh, also the Docker files are on GitHub, so you can uh, look what exactly we did on there. So um, our OpenCast uh, image Docker files are based on uh, the official Maven image, which is in turn based on Java and Debian Jesse. Um, in those Docker files, we compile OpenCast from source. Um, we fetch the source code from the Bitbucket repository, um, and we split those into multiple tags, which represent uh, the standard distributions that are provided with uh, OpenCast. Um, there are some uh, scripts inside those uh, images which automatically uh, configure OpenCast through the custom properties and so on. Um, and uh, those um, values for the configuration are fetched from the environment environment variables. So if you just set uh, the stuff that you need to configure, basically through environment variables, uh, your image will adapt to the environment you need. Um, and also we have some uh, Docker Compose examples, so you can quickly uh, try it out. Um, those include some sane defaults for those environment variables. Um, some example use cases that I'm going to show you now, uh, because I think some of you are asking, well, why would I want to use uh, OpenCast with Docker? I can just do it with RPM packages or something. Um, yeah, we have this five uh, use cases, like lowering the entry barrier to using OpenCast, development testing, uh, deployment, outsourcing your OpenCast uh, servers, and some nice, um, use cases that come from the granular resource uh, control. So first, lower the entry barrier. Um, we've been very new to the OpenCast community, um, and the first thing uh, that we noticed is that it's not really trivial to set up OpenCast if you have no idea what the system is. So um, I'm on the IRC quite regularly, and I'm reading the mailing list, and every so often someone comes in there and has some pain setting up something because some dependency is missing or some configuration is not really that obvious. Um, so with those Docker files, it all takes care of all of that. You just can start something up with Docker Compose and try OpenCast out for yourself. And you don't really have to read the documentations in depth. Of course, if you want to deploy those systems, you should read those documentations. But the first start is a little bit easier. Um, so demo time. I've said it's easy. You can just do it. So I'm going to show it to you. What, I, what I'm using here is um, one of our Docker Compose files. It's the multi-server uh, Compose file, which just will set up a, a distributed OpenCast system with an admin node, presentation node, worker node, a MariaDB uh, database server and an Apache uh, ActiveMQ. And if I just hit enter, it's going to create all those containers based on those images, start and up, all at the same time. And now um, it's, it's the log output we're seeing here is uh, the actual output from the OpenCast instances logs. And um, yeah, the database connection fails are because uh, the MariaDB take some time to start up and now it's up and running and we will start OpenCast. I should go on, come on. <laughs> okay, so it's starting up and it's running in the background and now I'll switch uh, to a browser. Oh, let's just wait a few seconds more. It takes some time so you can see all those three nodes starting up in parallel and spitting out their log files. 
and when it stops spitting out, it should be. <laughs> uh, okay, I think we can safely open it up. So, okay, take some more time. Uh, okay. Come on. Normal open cast. <laughs> Maybe we should write that into the readme that you can go get a coffee. <laughs> well, it's a laptop. Maybe on the faster system it would boot up faster. But no, okay. We have our open cast. Um, and we can just log in. We have our standard uh, user interface. Um, I'm just going to show you adding some recording. Uploaded the big bug bunny file, which somehow everyone uses. Some faster thing also. Okay, come on. Okay, so um, we've uploaded this to the multi uh, to the multi-server system, and when you switch back to the console, you can see that um, the admin server. Okay, it's a bit hard to read. Uh, this is the admin uh, admin node. It um, accepted this uh, file, and um, it should start the workflow in a few moments. Okay, it's taking some time. There is now the worker. Okay, now the worker, the yeah. Now the worker is inspecting the files. And uh, what's happening in the background, there are actually three nodes just with this one command, uh, automatically configured and set up and linked together. Um, so there's, there are actually two more, so the Maria uh, um, yeah. DB container and ActiveMQ. So with just one, one Lee <laughs> command, um, we have started uh, five containers yeah, and you okay. can run this command anywhere. I can show any you Docker PS, which shows us the running containers. It's a bit, okay, maybe I can do it like that. Mm. Yeah, okay. So you can see that we have um, those separate containers. This is the base image from which it's, uh, from which the container is based on, and this is the container name. And I think I'm still doing something. It's a laptop. Um, okay, it's running in the background. I'm going to continue with the next slide. Um, what would this be useful for, too? Uh, development and testing. Um, while developing OpenCast itself, as we said, our uh, Docker files compile OpenCast from the source, so you could easily just um, point it to your source directory on your machine where you are typing something and, and uh, compile this and have a really stable environment which doesn't care what uh, Java version is on your machine or something. So you can reproduce bugs um, and you can also run multiple uh, distributions parallel, which is a bit tedious right now. And you can also use uh, continuous integration with Travel, CircleCI, Jenkins, or whatever. Um, you have some fast and consistent deployment. Uh, like, like we said, uh, you can spin up a Docker uh, container instance in seconds, so um, instead of building a new VM, installing the packages, configuring the VM, uh, we have that already in there, and you can just start up a new Docker container, and you're pretty much done, pretty much. Um, also updating, it's just easy, pull the new image from the repository, start a new container, done. Um, for smaller or bigger institutions, uh, maybe you are so small you don't have a separate server room or you are so big, your server room is not big enough, um, you can outsource your OpenCast um, system to the cloud. With Docker, this is really easy. There are several, um, several uh, uh, providers uh, on which you can just start up your Docker containers um, on a very powerful system in the background, and um, with those Docker files, it's very easy. And you can really quickly scale. Let's say you have um, end of the day and 50 new videos come in, you just machine gun open cast workers out, <laughs> and, and you really have that done. That is something very interesting, I think. Um, also, granular resource control, what we covered earlier, you can say, okay, this container only gets one of my CPUs. 
many of us have custom built capture agents with uh, very powerful CPUs in them, but most of the time they are just sitting there and they're pretty much dead CPUs. They are not too used to no use to you. If you just start a worker container, you might run into the problems that uh, the, the worker will use so much resources that your capture agent doesn't work properly anymore. So with a container, you could say, okay, you only get two cores, and the other two cores are reserved for my garlic cast or whatever you use. And you can, you, you can leverage the CPU power you have left everywhere in your building. That's a nice thing to do, too. So maybe um, this is now ready. Nope. <laughs> That's a laptop. Okay, it's archiving, so we should be done really quick. Um, okay, and this is pretty much the use cases. I would have loved to explain but more, but we are running out of time. So again, I'm Jan Koppel. This is Matthias Neugebauer. Um, our opencast images, you can get them at those uh, URLs. Also, these slides are available too if you want to look at them afterwards and see what exactly we've done. And questions, maybe some important ones, but I think we're a little bit over right now. Okay. Okay, first of all, thank you for, for great work. Uh, my question is, uh, do you evaluate uh, the usage of CoreOS to uh, scale out the uh, deployment to multiple hosts, uh, to a cluster of multiple hosts? Uh, uh, right no, now? We, we haven't, so we are just starting right now, and we, um, we don't have yet um, created a cluster and uh, run uh, OpenCast on that. That's what but it done. should be um, doable. Yeah, we, so we are doing it on our own systems in the office, and it shouldn't be any different running it on the server because our office computers are also Linux. And, and also, we are running um, CentOS, and I don't think our infrastructure, also our yeah, provider, will allow us to run any other system. That's it. Um, just a quick question. Um, so OpenCast, as, as all of us know, has uh, quite a few configuration options, including you know workflows and encoding profiles and settings for this and that, and you know down to the nonce timeout of the digest authentication. And um, I think the current the the way so most people struggle with with conf getting the configuration right. Um, I've seen that you're you're suggesting. Um, using templates and you know um, environment variables to to get the configuration done. If I get that correctly, um, is is that a scalable approach from your perspective? So we we think that the most important variables that are required to run OpenCast should be configurable via uh, environment variables, but we can't um, yeah um, have all of the variables um, configured in that way, and we suggest to mount um, to um, copy your, um, the um, configuration on your um, on your host and just mount them in. And it will uh, on on a specific uh, directory. There is uh, documentation about that, and it will, it will just pick them up. So you're mount you're mounting. Um, so you're providing a volume, a configuration volume, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you can just uh, use volumes inside the Docker file, um, and or. You don't even have to modify the Docker file. You can do it to an uh, existing image and then just import a volume from a directory on your local file system into the file system of the container, which then contains your very special custom configuration options. It's no problem. <laughs> so um, it's not exactly um, a Docker specific problems, but um, one of the other issues people are running into is upgrades. So migrating from one OpenCast version to another. Um, do you see any any specific support Docker might provide? So we don't have yet all the pains about uh, upgrading, but I, um, 
it should. So if you don't run OpenCast, kind of. Uh, so um, for example, nginx, you just uh, kill your container, start uh, pull the new image, um, and uh, start the new um, start a new container uh, with that new image. And we hope that we can do that with OpenCast, but if um just to shortly answer your question, it works. Uh, I've been running uh, Docker for the test service for quite a while, so you just kill your image. Uh, the data is outside of your image, and it's still there, so you spin up your new device. S of course, you have to do the database upgrade. You have to do it anyway, but yeah. uh, you could just replace your uh, open cast, basically. I think that, that's what I was basically referring to. So maybe Docker provides us with a way, like the, the composition of Docker images, we could potentially use to to um, add in, um, like upgrade uh, migration uh, scripts, migration processes. Yeah, I think the. I think I think the main advantage in, in upgrading is that you don't need to um, worry about maybe the RPM packages not being cleanly built and leaving some files from previous version in your environment. You just uh, create a new environment for OpenCast, which is proven to work on your development uh, servers, and then you just push them onto your production servers, and they are essentially the same, and you have the new version without any stuff le left from the old installation. Yeah, so the, the point here is reliability. Um, you can use the same images on your test server, on your laptop, or wherever, and they should run exactly the same way on your um, servers. Yeah, just to leave it clear what I have mentioned. I mean, I'm not saying that Docker doesn't have its benefits. I'm just saying that, in particular, the concern of updating uh, from one version to the other, the main problem in this update seems to be the database. And uh, of course, uh, Docker addresses any other things. I think it's great for uh, the development, as you said, and for uh, replicating an environment in a very easy way, no matter uh, the machine you are running it. But in the specific case of uh, upgrading the database, I don't think it, it's much of help. Yeah, we still left with the same problems. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is out of the scope of packaging OpenCast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so one last comment. One, one last comment. So as, as these things are progressing, the, the packaging work, and it becomes easier and easier to actually uh, migrate the software, we may need to think about, as, do, as a development community, making sure that we can actually track what version the data belongs to, like which version of OpenCast created the data, you know, what is the database schema, um, is it compatible with that new version that is trying to run that software. So that's something we may want to keep in mind. I don't think we have been paying a lot of attention to that in the past. Thank okay. You. And the video is now rendered in the works.